All right, everybody, we'll get evening. It is 540. I'm the only thing standing between you all and the attendee party, I know. But we're going to have some fun together with hardware, microcontrollers, machine learning, and the Internet of Things. My name is Brandon Satram, and I work for an IoT product company called Blues Wireless. And as I start tonight, I actually want to start with a, a story from 1926. Uh, and that year, Nikola Tesla actually sat down with Collier's Magazine for an interview. And in that interview, he predicted unmanned aircraft guided by radio, the ability to use telephony and television to see each other face to face over vast distances, and the existence of a device that will fit into our vest pockets <laughs> to enable all forms of communication. I promise it's more fun in here. Don't listen to any of that noise. <laughs> now, this idea, that of converting the whole Earth into a huge brain through the power of wireless is one that has been applied again and again as evidence that we must continue our inexorable march into the future, starting with electricity, then the supercomputer, the computer, internet, mobile, and now the internet of things. Nothing will stop humanity in its progress towards connecting everything. And this tends to become the narrative you hear about around the internet of things as we put radios and everything, and that's just fantastic. We love it. But along the way, a different kind of Internet of Things has started to emerge, the invasive IoT. Perhaps many of you are familiar with the popular Twitter account, Internet of Shit. If not, check it out. It is pretty amazing. Uh, it's smart, right? I mean, we are in a world where connecting things is considered to be smart, but maybe too smart. Connected, but perhaps too connected. And so instead of a utopia of a connected world, we get devices that lose connections or firmware updates that disrupt our workflow, including when we're trying to use simple appliances and privacy concerns about the, the hardware that we purchase or security devices that can't tell a human from a t-shirt. Right, there's lots of examples of this kind of thing and what we've gotten to in the world of the Internet of Things is that we've added IoT, LEDs, blinky lights, connectivity to everything just because we could and are just now starting to ask ourselves whether or not we potentially should. These kinds of examples made it very, make it very easy for the IoT, the Internet of Things, to be dismissed as a fad. And there are also examples that can be really downright concerning. I'll share a couple of examples. The first comes from New York City, where several years ago, uh, the city started what was called the Link NYC Project, an effort to replace the city's phone booths with kiosks that provided charging ports and free Wi-Fi via a built-in hotspot. So this is a great idea, right? Many smart city projects like this usually are. And while the result was smart and useful to New York City residents and tourists, the method really was anything but. It turns out that Link NYC was uh, funded in part by, si by Sidewalk Labs, a subsidiary of Alphabet, Google at the time. And while the kiosks displayed advertising on a built-in marquee, something we would expect to see, it also collected and monitored all of the browsing data from phones connected to each hotspot. Why? To better sell ads, of course, right? It's smart, but also invasive. Here's another story, this time from China. Now, it's well known that China uses facial recognition technology throughout the country to catch criminals from thieves to jaywalkers. The systems match faces to, government ID, to the government IDs of perpetrators, and then it takes action depending on the crime. It might be an arrest, a fine, or the individual might be publicly shamed. For jaywalking, it's, it's a crime, but the penalty is often public shaming in the form of having your photo and name plastered on digital signs throughout the city. And this was the penalty that was meted out to Dong Ming Xu, who was president of a top air conditioning company in late 2018 in the Shesheng province, which is south of Shanghai. The problem is that Dong Ming Xu wasn't in the Zhejiang province when she was caught on camera, but her face was on the side of a public bus driving through the city. So this leaves us with really a key and critical question when it comes to how we think about the Internet of Things, connectivity, the smartness that we're asking for in our cities and in our infrastructure. And that is, can we as private citizens actually live private lives if we're connected to the Internet, if our cities are connected, if we're using AI and ML in every last thing? And I believe that the answer is yes, but it requires that we get smarter about how we deploy these sorts of systems and applications. And there are many ways to do this, from matching technology to policy goals and really thinking about and, and making sure that, in, that solutions are planned from a privacy-first standpoint. But I also believe that we can leverage the IoT and ML 
uh, to build these kinds of applications by actually taking a bit of the internet, specifically the internet, out, specifically the cloud, out of the internet of things. And it's, uh, it sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but I promise you it will make sense by the end because there's really two pieces that I want to talk about today. EdgeML, or TinyML, machine learning on constrained devices, and cellular IoT, and how these two things work together. So first I want to talk about our perceptions of machine learning and how it often relates to the cloud. Now it's not going to be a surprise to anybody, anyone that's worked with ML in the past, it's sort of the common perception around machine learning, deep learning, uh, whatever it might be, is that we tend to go through this exercise of we work in a local environment or with cloud-based notebooks to do things like preparing, collecting data, preparing it, defining a task that we're going to work on. And then we actually rely on the cloud to perform this piece of, of hosting, right? So we build our, we train our models in the cloud, and then we typically will deploy and host those models as APIs that are accessible in the cloud as well. But this has a couple of limitations. One is that we don't really a lot of times think, and this is critically important in the IoT, about where that real-time inference data actually comes from. The reality is that I think for many of us when we're getting started with ML, uh, with AI ML and deep learning is that we tend to work with pre-trained models that live out there somewhere, right? But if you're working in the Internet of Things, there is no pre-trained model for your elevator system. There is no pre-trained model for the accelerometer that needs to be attached to a machine or a motor. You have to many times start from scratch, right? And so we don't really often think about where that comes from. And it's also really important to note that you know cl major cloud providers do provide canned and pre-trained APIs. These are really useful, right? We can rely on Azure and other hyperscalers like them to provide services for vision, speech, language, knowledge, search, all these different kinds of things. But there really are a couple of limitations when it comes to how we think about the cloud and its role in the ML. To be completely clear, ML, I, the cloud is a perfect place for model training. But what I'm going to propose today is that there's actually a better approach for doing inferencing and prediction on constrained devices at the edge on microcontrollers, et cetera. And the reason for this is there's really three drawbacks to using the cloud for ML-based inferencing. The volume of data, the speed at which you can actually perform inferencing, and then the privacy considerations. So first, let's, let, let's talk about the volume of data. There's this desire to do more inferencing close to the metal because we're adding more and more devices, right? We have passed the point where the number of connected IoT devices has surpassed the combined number of mobile and desktop computing devices, and it's just going to get faster, expected to pick up over 159% per year over the coming years compared to 14% growth for other computing devices, right? We passed the era where people were buying mobile devices, new mobile devices in droves and are now at the place where we're looking at constrained IoT devices making up most of the volume of connections that we're adding. And as more and more devices come online, more of those devices will be connected and more of those will, will generate data data that needs to be saved and forwarded and processed. We'll continue to add devices and data and continue to add compute capacity in the cloud. But there's really one weak link between these two things that is probably patently obvious, obvious to most of us. And that is that while the cloud can theoretically always scale up to account for more and more data, and will always have the ability to add more and more devices because silicon is one of the most uh, abundant resources on the planet, Many times the pipes that we use to send data are relatively constrained. We're reaching the physical limit in terms of the amount of data that we can transfer both wired and wirelessly across our networks. The problem is that ML is a data hungry field, right? So if we're streaming every single thing, if we're streaming raw data, high resolution images, video, photos, accelerometer data, sensor data, and we're streaming that constantly across billions upon billions, perhaps trillions of devices, we're going to have a pipe problem in the end. But if we don't have to do inference in the cloud, we can actually still get the benefit of leveraging the cloud without having to worry about that constrained piece. Because in many cases, in many IoT applications, we send a piece of data to the cloud and we wait for that model to give us a result. But the real thing that we wanted was the actual prediction. That's the thing we wanted in the cloud in the first place, was the ability of a system to tell us some sort of thing that we can't observe ourselves based on the information that is being collected. So doing inference at the edge, it, you know, it not only helps us in the case of the data that we're sending across our pipes, but it also helps us in our ability to get information from devices faster. And this is very true in what's considered the holy grail of IoT use cases, preventive or predictive maintenance. 
So consider an industrial setting, and you've got a number of machines that are churning away 24-7. Now, each of those machines is connected with an IoT device that has an accelerometer that's constantly, constantly monitoring the vibration of the key motorized component. Now let's say that we have captured and tagged a lot of data and we've trained a neural network that knows what an out of variance vibration pattern looks like. So it knows what a machine starts to behave like when it's at when it's when there's an anomaly, when it's not behaving as it should and there's potentially a machine that needs to be serviced, right? So if we're making that prediction across a fleet of hundreds of devices and each of those is being sent across the cloud, then that's expensive. And as we discussed before, it's time consuming to send the data and there's a latency tax in being able to get that response back. But it also means that we can't perform predictions against our fleet when the network is offline or down for any reason. If there's no internet in the facility, there is no cloud to rely upon for being able to make that sort of inferencing happen. But if we move inferencing to a machine in the local network, on every individual device, or even to a gateway and the edge, we can get the benefit of ML with the speed of local processing. So finally, and this is, you know, this is the piece that is probably makes the most sense to many of us, is that inferencing at the edge is fundamentally more secure, right? When we're sending only outputs or predictions back to the cloud, but not all of the input or source data, it's much easy to build, easier to build ML and IoT applications that are resilient to data manipulation and the respect of privacy of the data being collected and the owners of that information. So I mentioned earlier that there's a set of APIs out there from hyperscaler cloud providers that provide a lot of very robust trained models for things like face, voice, and you know, image detection, streaming, et cetera. One of those great examples is the Azure Face API. Uh, it's a very, very powerful service. Microsoft has done a ton to make sure that this API is used responsibly and not for ill intent, but it is still something that what I'm doing basically in order to get some bit of information from an image, I send an image to Azure, to the Azure Cognitive Services Face API. It will give me back the coordinates that I can use to draw a bounding box around the image for every face that it sees. It gives me metadata about the face. It can tell me the predicted age, the gender of the individual, how their head is tilted, the pitch and yaw of their, of their head, whether or not they're smiling, whether or not they have facial hair. And it'll also give a prediction of one, or one of six major emotions that it observes on each face in the image. This is actually really powerful, and it's, pa and it's interesting that we can do that through this service. And Azure doesn't store these images. As soon as, it, as soon as it interprets them, it throws them away. But I am still transferring an image with potentially personally identifiable information across the internet in order to get that information from Azure. And this is really where what's referred to as TinyML or EdgeML, machine learning on microcontrollers, really shines, right? There's a lot of different benefits that we get from taking this kind of an approach. Not only can we actually do, you know, build applications that because of their speed, latency, and privacy protecting features can be innovative for businesses, but again, it's private, privacy protecting, data stays on the device. You can build constrained applications that can actually run on battery power for longer periods of time because you're not turning on a cellular or a Wi-Fi modem or connecting the ethernet every single time you need to make a prediction. You can save on storage and compute costs in the cloud and use more constrained devices. And you can also deal, like I talked before, about having low latency situations. In the case of privacy, in the case of image recognition especially, this is really powerful because what we can actually do is get a prediction that happens more close, you know, closer to where that occurs, but in a place that is effectively off the internet in many cases. So using the Azure ML, the cognitive services example again, if you've ever used this service before, this JSON payload is effectively what you get back from that service, right? As I said before, face attributes, a prediction of emotion from sadness, surprise, contempt, anger, disgust, information about facial hair. The great thing about this is that if I can actually get this and, you, and make this be the thing that I send to the cloud, there is nothing in that JSON object that can be reconstructed to match the person in that photo. It is inherently more privacy preserving for me to do that. Now we think a lot about EdgeML and the IoT because there's a ton of very amazing use cases that we can work on in this space from wearables. If anybody has an Aura ring, you actually have bought a product that's doing machine learning on a microcontroller. There's a microcontroller inside of this device. Very powerful for wearables, for, space that for, uh, for spaces, for voice commands, people counting, HVAC maintenance, all that good stuff, industry, and then logistics as well. <coughs> and all of this 
very, if you've ever worked with ML before, all of this tracks very nicely with work that many people are already doing in the ML space. If you've worked with TensorFlow, you know how to work with TensorFlow on microcontrollers. Uh, in fact, the TensorFlow team has a effectively a subset of TensorFlow called TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers that has been purpose built to be able to operate on constrained devices that don't have as much flash and RAM as the devices that we work with today. And the way that it works is actually pretty easy. So if you, unless you leverage your existing ML skills while adding some easy inferencing features, most of the support for this today is in C and C++. So if you do work with Arduino, you do work in that environment, it's pretty easy to adapt uh, these sorts of models to that. But so let's say, for instance, that I actually had, I was building sort of a contrived model that gives me uh, basically y equals mx plus b, the slope of a line given a set of y and x values. And if I have all the x's and I have all the y's, but I don't know the m's and the b's, that's effectively a machine learning problem. I need it to actually tell me uh, how to associate those two sets of values. So I pass my x's and y's uh, into the model. I create a simple single dense layer model using TensorFlow, uh, TensorFlow Lite and Keras. Actually, this is just full on TensorFlow. Uh, compile the model using gradient descent and a a mean squared error loss function, fit the model over 200 epochs, and I have the same sort of model that I would build in TensorFlow for a full-on machine learning application or with a microcontroller. But then I can convert this into TensorFlow Lite, again, using TensorFlow's APIs. I take that saved model, I, I run it in the built-in TensorFlow Lite converter, convert that into a smaller object, and now I have this TF Lite file that is ready, almost ready, to be run on a microcontroller. But this is where the last fun piece comes in. Because in order to run a machine learning model on a microcontroller that doesn't have a concept of a file system, I need to be able to represent this as an object in memory. Well, the great thing about machine learning is that it's deep learning especially is that most of these models are literally just arrays, vectors, and matrices of numbers. And so what TensorFlow Lite gives me is the ability to turn that into a C array representation of a model that I can load up and then run on the fly. Now, I shared all of that with you as an example to say that most of the work in the tiny ML space actually doesn't involve that level of detail or the direct creation of m models with machine learning or with TensorFlow Lite anyway, because one of the challenges that we have in the IoT space, I mentioned this a bit earlier, when I talked about using pre-trained models and the fact that we don't have that in this space, is that there are a lot of great tools out there that actually make it possible for you to build models and do the data collection piece yourself. And we have some friends and partners of ours uh, at a company called Edge Impulse, and they, create, they make a very, very easy, dead simple, web-based way of building many types of ML models, including from data ingestion all the way to building the actual model itself. And this is uh, really, really interesting. It's a developer-friendly tool. And it really can be as simple as, as you need or as complex as you want it to be. And the way that it works is you basically take your edge device, some microcontroller of sorts. You actually use that edge device connected to a sensor, and I'll show you a demo of this in a second, to collect the information that you want in your machine learning model. Use their web-based API or their web-based dashboard to then train the model, deploy it to your device, and you're off to the races. And that's a nice description, but let's actually show it. Let's actually see it in action really quick. So I have on my I have on the desk here next to me a device that is connected to a microcontroller, an Arduino-based microcontroller, and there's a triple axis accelerometer on the back. And ultimately, the demos that I'm going to build today are building a gesture recognition model that uses machine learning to tell me whether or not the device is idle. Yeah, that's easy. But also can determine whether or not I'm performing this action, we'll call a chop, and then by the end, a wave action. So it can actually use the accelerometer data that I've collected to perform that level of insight. What's cool about this approach is that with what Edge Impulse gives me the ability to do is to create applications and then connect to physical microcontrollers to gather that data. So I'm not sending in fake data. I'm not sending in somebody else's accelerator accelerometer data. I'm actually collecting mine for my actual application. And this works with a command line utility that they have called the Edge Impulse Data Forwarder. So when I uh, launch this, what it's going to do, and actually let me show you the other piece first before I actually start that, is because what I need to do first is actually put something on the microcontroller. And so I have a, I have a couple of applications that I'm going to show you here that have all been built with Platform I.O. Uh, and Visual Studio Code. If you haven't used Platform I.O. before, it is a far superior programming experience and working with the Arduino IDE. 
uh, and it is a very easy way to work with th thousands of different microcontrollers, again, using Visual Studio Code, which is everybody's favorite. So I have my, uh, I have my device. I have my triple access accelerometer, which is this device from Adafruit. I'm initializing a connection to the device. And then really all I'm doing to run this application in my loop is I am just streaming the X, Y, and Z value out to the serial console. Serial is connected to the device, to my device here over USB. And I'm streaming that out. And so when I go at, when I put this, when I upload this onto my application or onto the microcontroller that's connected here, it's going to take a moment to build it, program it very quickly. And then when I open the serial monitor, oh, it's going to do that to me. Hold on. When I open the serial monitor again, hold on. I knew I was tempting fate not to have demo fails earlier today, so I'm going to set close all of these for this guy. And should be able to upload. Run through the upload again very quickly. Oh, that's the wrong one. help if I put the right program on it. So at least we figured that we figured that issue out. So I'm going to load new flash on here. It's going to come on line and I will connect to it. And this time it's going to work. I just believe it's son of a gun. What's going on? Yeah, it's there. Well, it, it, it thinks that something else has a connection to the USB port. So Let's live debug this together, y'all. I'm going to close my terminal. Hmm. <laughs> I'm going to close Visual Studio Code. All right. Let's let's start fresh. <laughs> Our platform IO is opening, serial monitor. There we go. Okay. So what's being streamed out to the serial terminal right now is basically just the X, Y, and Z readings as I'm moving the accelerometer around. You'll see those, you'll see that information change. Now I'm going to close this now because I need to access this information from the the Edge Impulse Data Forwarder. So I'm going to do that. It's asking me which device that I want it to connect to because it's seeing a couple. And what it's doing right now is it actually has, it's seeing data that's being streamed to the serial port and it knows that it can read it. So it's detected that it's at a frequency of 735 hertz and it's asking me which project to tie it to. So I can choose one. It detects that frequency, and then it asks me to label the data. So everything it sees is X, Y, and Z values. I know that's what's coming in. So I'm actually going to then go into Edge Impulse Studio. And from here, what I can do, I have a physical connection to the device, and I can label all of the information. So I'm basically going to start collecting data. And this is a time-consuming process, but not nearly as time-consuming as if I was having to find this information parse it, upload it into some sort of service. Because it has a physical connection to my device, it knows what I'm doing. And I'm sitting at the, it's sitting on the desk right now, so I labeled this idle. When it's done sampling, it'll show me, okay, this is what it's detected. This is, this is the wave pattern for X, Y, and Z over 10 seconds that corresponds to idle. If I run it again and I change the, change the uh, label to chop, and I start doing this for 10 seconds, Change arms, they'll get tired, have a friend help you, you know. This is the this is the fun part of machine learning, I guess. I don't know, they say. So you'll see now this is different, right? I actually have a different waveform. Uh, my X and Y are staying relatively consistent, but Z is changing a lot. And I'll do that over and over and over again. Um, I did that for an application that I'm gonna that I'm gonna load for the last demo. 
But an early version of this, I grabbed about 12 minutes worth of 10 second chunks where I did a variation between chop and idle and then a third gesture that I'm going to show you in a little bit. That's the easy part or the, the time consuming but straightforward part in Edge Impulse. And then from there, you basically do a, you have a visual, pr a visual way of building your machine learning model from that, right? This is a time series model that I want to do spectral analysis on. And ultimately, I have three inputs. I'm chopping my window size down into 2,500 milliseconds, so every 10-second block gets split into four. That gives me more data for the model to work with. Uh, and then I'm s choosing my spectral analysis, and then I want to classify those. And it detects, based on the tags that you specify, what your potential outputs are going to be. So your input is a series of X, Y, and Z values. The output that you want from a model is what's the gesture, idle or chop, or at the end, it'll be wave. You go through that process. You'll then generate those spectral features, and you can sort of see what information you get across all of the different samples that you've collected. Um, you'll build the classifier, and this is a bit of a time-consuming process, but that's why I'm actually not showing you through it. What Basically, what happens is that Edge Impulse goes through and builds that model for you using their cloud infrastructure. They show you what the, the architecture looks like, 33 inputs, a 20-layer 20, 20 dense layer, another 10-layer, these two hidden layers, and your output turns into three, one of three potential classes. Not only do you get an idea of the accuracy of your model and where you have potential issues, but you can sort of scroll around and see where the trouble spots are, and then you get some idea of what the device's on-device performance is going to be. Um, in 1.7K, 19, fla 19K flash, maybe for an old 8-bit Arduino, that's a lot, but for most modern microcontrollers with 2 megs of flash and a mega RAM, this is next to nothing. And it can perform inferencing in one millisecond. So or we're way away from the days where you could do ML on microcontrollers, but it was really, really slow. It's getting faster and faster all the time. Once I'm happy with the model that I've got, I can actually go through this deployment tab and get CAN sample code for C, Arduino, et cetera, and I'll choose which one that I want. And then they actually do, uh, Edge Impulse provides something called the Eon, Eon Compiler, Eon Tuner, that will take a look at the different optimizations that I've made and give me some sort of sense of whether or not I can use a quantized or an unoptimized float32 model. Again, many microcontrollers can handle uh, a 32-bit float uh, unquantized or unoptimized model, especially some of the newer ones, so it's totally an option. What I end up getting when I, um, what I end up getting when I build that model is a zip file that has what I need to ultimately run my application. So I'm going to now open my, where is it, gesture predictor. This is why I wanted to have these things open earlier, right? Gesture predictor. So I'm going to open my other application now. And what, what uh, Edge Impulse gives me is basically a zip file that contains their SDK and everything that I need. My model expressed in a header file that I can include uh, in order to perform inferencing. And then for me to actually then do the work of running inferencing against this, all I need to do is come back into my old application and pull in the magic swan inferencing, the header, the header file that corresponds to my project, and start the accelerometer like before. But this time, instead of spitting all that data out to the serial terminal, what I'm going to do is every two seconds take a sample. That sample goes into a buffer, right? for every uh, the 10 seconds and then that and then delays for just a microsecond or two that buffer is then turned into something that edge impulse or what edge impulse is basically a wrapper on tensorflow light like i mentioned earlier and then it runs the classifier it takes that 10 seconds worth of data it runs the classifier on it there's some error handling in here and then it'll print out to the console exactly what it saw it shows me the classification label and the value and it will tell you for all of the gesture types that it has data for, what percentage confidence it has, just like you would see in any other kind of a machine learning model. So if I now upload this one, got to connect my programmer again. It's going to build and take a second. But what I'll end up seeing when I run this is every two seconds, it's going to gather that you know, a, a second, actually in this case, I said 10 seconds, it's going to grab a second or two of data and it is going to make a prediction. So right, right now it's predicting idle because my device isn't moving. But if I start doing this, hopefully 
It'll show me a chop. There we go. It's predicted chop based on the accelerometer data it's seeing. And the only reason it's the only reason you're seeing it go as slow as it is is because I'm the one delaying by two seconds. So I could actually run this a lot more quickly. But you do still need to figure out some window of data to send to the model. If you're sending x, y, and z values every millisecond, you're probably not going to like what you see. So that is, that it's really as simple as that. I mean, I skipped over the half an hour or so of data gathering that you would need to go, but really the rest of the process was pretty easy. Uh, and that's machine learning, right? That is machine learning on microcontrollers. It is a very low latency, privacy protecting, power cons conservational way of dealing with working with ML uh, in, in devices. But one of the things that we haven't really talked about yet is how how this relates to the IoT part of things. Because everything I've showed you so far, there is no internet outside of me building the model. Everything else is offline. But the reality is that many times we're doing machine learning, we're doing inferencing even at the edge. There is still something we want to send. There is still a piece of this that's related to how we actually get that data into the cloud. And here, uh, we've got a lot of challenges in the IoT. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, we are in a place where I think we're reckoning with the fact that we've had project projections of billions upon billions of connected devices that haven't really held true. And we're big believers that one of the reasons for that is because this place, th this space is just, there's way too much complexity in the work that we saddle developers with in the IoT, whether it's with data plans or whether it's hardware that's difficult to grok or hard to work with. Whatever it is, there's a lot of complexity. And when I think about complexity, I like to think about a quote from uh, my boss, our CEO and founder of Blues Wireless, complexity kills. And, and this is something that he said many, many years ago, uh, but it, man, it, it really, really applies to the IoT space. We are awash in complexity. And, you know, we started Blues Wireless with this idea of making developer friendly cellular easier. And so uh, we are not a cell service provider, we are a wireless technology products company, and we're focused on making that internet piece of things easier so that ML applications can actually do what they need to do. So monitoring applications can actually do what they need to do. And so we provide hardware and services that back up our message of making wireless IoT easier for developers and more affordable for all. And I'm going to breeze through some of this really quickly, but if you've ever experienced working with IoT devices before, uh, you have experienced a lot of issues with security, with developer friendly radios with working with wireless technology and so we try to make our core mission mission having data that is secured from a device to the cloud being able to build zero configuration low power hardware which I'll show off in a second providing a really great developer experience so that this isn't the kind of thing that as a developer you get saddled with and being told like hey go and learn how to read you know how to write the AT commands for this modem good luck and we we need to deliver the product in 2 weeks uh, that we really focus on trying to make things easier. And it starts with our core product is a, is a tool, is something called the note card. It's a low power system on module device, 30 by 35 millimeters. I have one up here. You're welcome to come take a look at it afterwards. It's got an M.2 edge connector on here. Uh, it has global cellular and GPS or Wi-Fi. Cellular, we have coverage in over 139 countries. And one of the things that really drew me to Blues now about two and a half years ago is that the device has 500 megs of cell data and 10 years of service included in the cost of the device. So it's not priced like a little mini cell plan that you have to pay four bucks a month for every month until the end of time. The data and the service is included in the cost of the hardware. And another one of my favorite things is there's a JSON-based API, uh, which I'll show you in just a second. And another, another one of my favorite things is that we have support for Python, Go, Rust, Arduino, uh, TinyGo, C, C++, um, C Sharp as well. One of the folks on my team has is, is, uh, worked on, on doing some things around the, in the C Sharp ecosystem. Because there actually are some cool microcontrollers that run, that, that run .NET. So uh, there's some cool things you can do there. And then finally, on the cellular piece, we have support for narrowband IoT, LTEM, and Cat1. Now that device is on an M.2, so obviously we have, we have customers that then design their own hardware that they deploy this in the field. But that's not feasible for uh, those of us prototyping. For us developers, we need something to get to started using quickly. And so we have a tool, uh, we have a, a set of products called Note Carriers that are dev boards for easy prototyping. And then on the cloud service side, those devices have to go somewhere. Now, we're not an end-all, be-all platform. We're not trying to grow to become the thing you have to buy if you're doing 
uh, IoT application, but we do have a cloud service that sort of is the pair to the note card. We like to think of these two things as a device to cloud data pump. They only exist to solve the tricky middle piece of getting information from your devices, from your sensors, into your cloud applications. And the way that we facilitate that is with a tool called NoteHub that can route data to any cloud app, to manage, it uh, works with managing fleets of devices, it provides over-the-air firmware updates, which I will talk a bit more in a moment, and secure communications. Uh, data is transferred off the public internet via encrypted tunnels, and the data itself can be encrypted end-to-end, -end, so no one other than you with the keys has the ability to actually see it. Uh, I mentioned JSON earlier. What's really cool about programming this device is that everything is JSON in and JSON out. If you've ever worked with a cellular IoT device before, you've experienced the pain of writing AT commands. AT commands, if you haven't heard of this, uh, is the command set that was used to program modems back in 1983, and it is still the state of the art for IoT <laughs> for cellular modems. That sucks. Uh, we prefer JSON. It's much easier. So here's an example of the card.location API that's at our docs. You can actually get information from the GNSS module on there, find out the last GPS update, the current latitude and longitude, and the time that that was collected. End to end, what we end up getting, like I said earlier, is a device to cloud data pump, a set of systems that is really focused on letting you work with Python, write with a Raspberry Pi, build with Arduino, build with an STM32 microcontroller, we don't care, send JSON to talk to the radio, and then from the cloud service, take everything where it, where it needs to go. Many of our customers and developers already have a cloud somewhere. They already have infrastructure. They know where they want to work, and so we tend to make it easy to work with them. And then you get to do the fun part. Well, I consider it a fun part because I am a, a front-end developer by long background before I switched into this space about seven years ago. I spent the first several uh, 15 years of my career working primarily as a web developer. And so this is the fun part, right? We want all that data out of the cloud. We want, or want all that data into our services and into our systems because we want to actually be able to do something, visualize something, uh, being able to actually able to make decisions based on the information that we see. And so that's the next piece that I want to demo very briefly before I get into the fun last part. And that is just how the, the note card makes this part easier to then take that information from our cloud applications and do, uh, excuse me, from our ML applications and do something with it. So I'm going to close this one out because I don't trust what's happening here. Open, okay, there's another version of Platform.io. And I am now going to open a different version of the application. It's the exact same model that you saw before. Uh, it's the exact same information from Edge Impulse, but I, I made one tiny modification. The modification that I did in this place is I added this note card library. We have an Arduino library that makes it very easy to work with a device. I mentioned earlier that I have, uh, you know, I have this microcontroller. This is a microcontroller called the Swan. It's an STM32-based MCU. There's an accelerometer on the back, but this is sitting in one of these note carriers, and there's a note card, a, a basically what we refer to this as a narrow band global note card that it works in that works in 139 countries, even Norway. I promise, because I'm using it right now, and you'll get to see that. Um, but all of this together is a very, very easy, compact platform. And we have an Arduino library that makes it very simple for me to work with that. And so what I have done is imported the library. And then I have a couple of other settings here. I've created a note card object. And then there's this thing called a product UID that I've created an association to. And a product UID is effectively just a, it's a unique identifier that when the note card wakes up, it comes online. It has keys burned into the secure element on the device, so I don't have to send any keys across the network. But I do need to tell our cloud service what project this device belongs to. In this case, this is my Smarter Everything project. And so I get that product UID, I include that in the project. And then when I come online, I'm sending JSON commands. Now, if you're working with Python, you're working with other uh, let's say more modern programming languages, not C and C++. It's really easy to work with JSON. C and C++ are so old, there was no JSON at the time, so it can be a bit of a challenge to work with it, but not onerous. We have a library that is included with our note card library that makes it very easy to create JSON objects and read JSON responses. That's what this ultimately is. I'm basically associating my project to its, or my note card to its project. I'm setting its serial number, 
And then I'm setting this mode to basically say this is how it's going to be connected to the internet or connected to, to the Note Hub service. Continuous doesn't mean it's sending data all the time. It just means that when the note card makes a connect connection to the cell tower, it tries to keep it open so that any time it needs to exchange data, it can actually do so. And then everything is I've got is before. I'm performing inferencing, this time every 10 seconds, just to slow things down a little bit. And then when I get a result, <coughs> what I'm doing is I'm sending that to the note card through what's called a note.add. Um, notes, note card, uh, these, these terms actually come from the fact that our uh, that Ray Ozzie, our founder and CEO, has his history uh, in Lotus Notes. He was a creator of Lotus Notes way back in the day. And a lot of the programming model here and sort of how we think about the IoT, networking the IoT, really takes its roots in how they thought about networking uh, in the late 80s and early 90s when, let's face it, those computers had about the same RAM and flash as the devices that are sitting on our desktops today, or as the w this one that's sitting on my desktop today. So you add a note to the note card to specify this is an arbitrary piece of data that I'm sending, and that arbitrary piece of data has a JSON body. As long as it's valid JSON, it can be anything that you want, and I'm sending that along to the note card as well. I send that up, and it'll show up uh, in the cloud service once that, once that um, prediction has been made. So I'm now going to upload this version of the app that adds in the note card, and then I'll open up the serial monitor. When that is done, it's going to take a moment to build. You'll see that my device is already online here. This is what my device looks like. I see that it's connected. It's ready to go. And so as soon as that is done, I'm going to open up the serial monitor again. And you'll see that I, I'm actually sending out some debug messages here that show that I'm talking to the note card. It's delaying. going to start inferencing in 10 seconds. So I'm going to start doing my chop now just so I don't miss it. It's going to perform that sampling. It caught a chop, and you'll see it has this. This is the note. The body has the DSP value, the time to classify, and then the actual prediction, and then the confidence in that prediction. And it's running another one 10 seconds later, and it saw that it was idle this time. That information goes to the note card, and it shows up in here as a arbitrary piece of JSON data, right? So that's great. I got JSON data in the cloud. That's all fine and good, but again, like I mentioned earlier, what I really want to do is visualize that. And so I'm not going to belabor exactly how this works, but there are a ton of great cloud services out there that work with these, that work with our system. You can create routes to really anything, any arbitrary HTTP request response, anything that can catch a webhook, you can route data to. We have support for AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, Snowflake, MQTT, et cetera. But I've set up one to this cloud service from friends of ours in Germany called Datacake. Datacake is a very easy, low friction, uh, basically IoT data, vi data visualization platform. And so all of my data, as it comes in, it gets automatically routed out to Datacake. They have nice response for us. Their, their response message is thanks. I like that. That's a good 200 code. Uh, and then I can create a dashboard based on that. So you'll see that the latest prediction that I got from Datacake was idle. If I ran this and, and stood around for a little while, you might actually see it update to chop again. Let's see if it's actually oh, it's sampling right now. Oh, it's still idle. Come on. Oh, it disconnected. There we go. I knew I was tempting fate. Uh, so it made that prediction recently. It shows me the confidence and also shows me where the device is located and where it was located the last time we ran it. Hotel right here, conference center. Great. Uh, so again, this data, these platforms, there's other great tools out there like UbiDots. There's a tool called Losant. It's fantastic to use. But again, our, our goal is to really allow you to get that data into these applications quickly so that you don't have to worry about how to... Uh, how to interface with them, how to program them. So one more final piece before I'm done. And this is the exciting piece because what we've talked about so far, I, everything else is exciting, of course. This is the most exciting piece because, you know, we talked about ML and being able to do inferencing on, on, on constrained devices, and that's really exciting. And the ability to then send inferencing to the cloud over sort of zero frills, wireless connectivity is also exciting. But the reality is that we're sending inferencing data we're sent, we have an ML model that's running, but most real-world machine learning models do update. They do need to be improved and refined over time. 
And so one of the other challenges that we have in this space is how you then take that new model and get it back down onto the device without actually having to physically go and touch it. And so we actually provide a facility with this as well by something, uh, b basically OTA or over-the-air ML model updates where the note card, where the cellular device can actually take a new version of your model or a new application binary and put it on your microcontroller for you without you having to go and touch it. And this is a feature that we've just released in beta, and we call it outboard DFU. And we use the word outboard here like an outboard motor on a boat. It's a motor that's attached to, but it's not an integrated part of the boat. And it effectively is lashed onto the craft, and it can drive it independently. Um, so outboard DFU is a similar approach. It's, it's this thing that we have, it provides the benefit of being able to use NoteHub and the note card, uh, uh, excuse me, use the note hub and deliver binaries into our cloud service. The note card then downloads those binaries and, and will write the app code onto the device itself. And the crazy thing about this is that it's possible to do this without you as the developer having to do more than opting into one tiny little JSON request. You don't have to litter your app code with a whole bunch of knowledge about what's actually going. If you've ever done uh, firmware updates in app code on an ESP32 or on a Nordic uh, NRF52840 device, you know that you get into this weird state where you have to actually have your application aware that it has a binary and then update the device with that binary. This is great, it works well, except when you ship a code down into the application that prevents that binary update job from actually running. What we do is the note card lives outside of your application and can actually put your device into its bootloader if you're using an STM32 or if you're using a Nordic device or an ESP32, it's almost like physically uh, hitting the boot and reset pins on a device to put in the bootloader. We do that by making a connection between the devices. Once it enters in a bootloader, we can stream in the binary. The cool part about this is that you can actually use whatever programming language you want. So you can use Arduino, C, C++, CircuitPython. You can move from a CircuitPython application to an Arduino application using this approach without having to do anything to touch the device. So this is the last demo that I want to show you today because I think it's actually pretty cool. So I mentioned earlier that I had, you saw in, my, in the demo that I was running earlier, see if it's running again, you'll see that I only have two gestures here, chop and idle. Right now, that's all that this model is able to predict because that's all that's in the, that is all that's in the model that I've provided to it. But I've since decided, okay, I actually want to do more. And you saw a sneak peek of this earlier. In the final version of what I have in Edge Impulse, I actually have this wave gesture as well. So I have the ability to actually do this and get some sort of a uh, thing out of it. But you'll see, if I do this now with the current version of the model, this has no idea what's actually happening. Uh, it doesn't have any way of interpreting this as anything other than idle. It just, just guesses, right? So I've created a new version of this model. And much like before, when I've built that, <coughs> I have a binary, right? I have, or excuse me, I have a zip file. That zip file I use to then update my application in Visual Studio Code. But rather than using my ST-Link programmer to put it on the device, let's say that I have a set of these devices that, don't, that, aren't, that aren't living on my desk. They're actually somewhere else. I need to get this binary down to the device. So what I can actually do once I've gotten that new version of the application built is I can go into NoteHub and ship that binary or uh, upload that binary here and then start to tag it to the device by going into the device tab, clicking on host firmware, selecting the device, and then updating, choosing this binary, right? My firmware v2, that's the binary that I'm going to apply. I'll click proceed. And then I'm going to show you something here with a connection to the note card. So we have, and our, our docs are all at dev.blues.io, so I encourage you to go check those out uh, at some point if you're ever interested in learning a little bit more about sort of who we are and what we do. But one of the features that we have is we have web USB support. So if you have the note card connected over USB serial, uh, you can actually terminal right into it effectively and get information about the device, right? Um, what I can also do, so I can get information about how it's connected, all this kind of information, I can send commands. Um, but what I'm going to do is I can also ch I can also trace this the network communication that's happening. This isn't on by default, but I can actually get the information uh, that is being written out to the console as the note card syncs to the note hub, et cetera. But what's cool about this is that when I sync, 
I can actually start to see the DFU take place. And you'll see it pop by very, very quickly. See if I can scroll up and keep it up. Uh, as you'll see this mention of firmware dash v2 then. So it's actually what's happening right now is my application is still running. You'll see, um, you'll see some information stream through. You'll still see notes for my note card. It's still the, the actual app. User app is running and making inferencing predictions. There's one right there. But it's also downloading the binary in the background. And all that I needed to do in my application code in order for this to actually work is send this other request to the note card called card.dfu. What I'm basically saying is telling the note card, hey, I'm going to allow you to update my firmware. This is opt-in, of course. I'm going to allow you to update my firmware. I am an STM32, right? Because it works differently for different microcontrollers, so we have to have the note card be aware of the device that you're sending, and go ahead and turn this on. And this is a signal to the note card that as soon as it gets a binary from the host, it's, it's ready to go. It's going to update that, and it is going to um, start streaming it onto the device. And so we'll see. It's going to take a few moments here. It looks like it's actually relatively close to done. That's performing the direct DFU now. And so you'll see what happens. I mean, it, not to get too super technical, but as you're, as you're reading some of this stuff, what happens is the note card is basically giving or taking 4K chunks of, of memory out of its internal flash and laying that down on the STM32. The STM32 is in its bootloader right now, and it's just waiting for those bytes to be written uh, one 4K chunk at a time. So this is going to run. I'll see how much time I have left. I got 10 more minutes in this talk, so we can just stand here in silence until the thing finishes, and it's going to be it's going to be great. No, uh, it's actually relatively quick. It depends, of course, on the size of the binary. The note card has room for about a, a meg and a half. So if you have a binary that's really large, you can actually use the note card uh, with this just fine. So let's see if we get a little bit remaining. And as I, I'm going to share a few more slides and then come back to that really briefly. Because I did want to say really briefly, we, we spend a lot of time writing projects because we are developers. We are a developer-focused company. My team and I spend most of our time actually building samples and examples, writing our docs, doing all the kind of stuff that, that we would want to see as developers. And we publish a lot of our projects on a website called hackster.io. If you haven't seen this site yet, it's a project share site, really popular site. So we do full write-ups, and we have about 40 or so different projects up there at this point, some that we've written, others by community members. They really walk you through a ton of different ways. There's a ton of ML-based projects. We do a lot with uh, we do a lot with Edge Impulse. Um, we have done uh, some fun projects with Edge Impulse. In fact, a colleague of mine who's in the audience has done like a speed trap that he built with Edge Impulse, a bird detector, all this kind of stuff. There's some great stuff out there, and it's all at Hackster.io. So let's see if this is oh, it's still going close. Oh no, now it's actually reconnecting to the cell network. So. We're on, we're on, we're back in action. So let me actually go back into the, let's see, which application is this predictor note card? If I can find the right place to launch a serial monitor. Yeah. Let's do it in this one. There we go, that's the one. So look now, you'll see there's a third gesture, chop, wave, and idle. So when I go here, now I see a wave. I didn't manually program this. If I didn't have physical access to the device, I still would have been able to completely lay down new firmware, new model update. Nothing about my main user application even changed because it's smart enough to read from Edge Impulse, from the SDK itself, the number of gestures that it needs to detect. So uh, that is really the power of sort of how you can bring the IoT and machine learning together, not, not just for being able to take inferencing get that information into the cloud, but being able to actually get model data, model updates as those come down back onto the devices themselves. So uh, thank you all for coming today. I really appreciate you taking the time. If you're interested in learning more about Blues, this QR code will get you 20% off of one of our dev kits. Uh, you feel free to reach out to, uh, to me at brandon at blues.io. Uh, happy to answer any questions you have. I can answer questions now, and I'll also be here for a few minutes afterwards. So. Thanks and have a great rest of the event.